Hey dudes, so since I started my channel, I have been very pleased in seeing many people build up the courage to use finasteride. Finasteride is the best treatment we have on the market for fighting androgenic alopecia in men, and more and more often we're hearing people report their only regret in taking the drug is that they didn't start it sooner. So compared to say five years ago, the fear mongering against the drug has died down, and more and more often we're seeing people start finasteride and realize that all the fear mongering from the anti-finasteride, hypochondriac, basement dwelling clowns is not backed by any quality evidence-based research whatsoever. Recently, however, and I don't know who is to blame for this, it seems like people are concerned about the long-term efficacy of finasteride. Many people are worried the drug loses its effectiveness or just flat out stops working after five years or so. Now, I can understand this concern because after all, androgenic alopecia is a long-term fight and we want to have a weapon against hair loss that maintains reliability over the long haul. Long-term efficacy is often something that is not known in pharmaceuticals, even when they're FDA approved, since as rigorous as FDA approval process is, there is no prerequisite for establishing long-term efficacy. So, like, we don't know if it's going to still be effective five or ten years down the road, even if it is FDA approved. So, let's go ahead and do some research on the subject so we can see if these fears are corroborated by any actual research. So, fortunately, I found three very high-quality studies released within the past decade on the subject, with the oldest from 2011. Now, before I delve into details, I want to point out that all these studies on finasteride uh, being effective long-term were done using finasteride standard one milligram dose. So regardless of outcome, I cannot say for certain whether or not these studies will also apply to people who adjust their titration or frequency, but I will quickly point out that finasteride is not a very dose-dependent drug. And what I mean by that is that in terms of DHT suppression, even small doses suppress almost as much DHT as standard standard doses. Like, for example, just 0.2 milligrams of finasteride suppresses 55% of DHT compared to 5 milligrams, which suppresses 69% of DHT. So regardless of titration or dosing adjustments, I think it's logical to believe that studies conducted at the standard 1 milligram dose will still likely apply to people who adjust their dosages for cost or due to fear of side effects. So, Anyways, going over the oldest study, it was conducted over 10 years and it involved 118 men with androgenic alopecia and they were aged 20 to 61 years, years old. Uh, the severity of their hair loss ranged from Norwood 2 to Norwood 5, so they probably figured anyone above a Norwood 5 is probably a lost cause. They also included some exclusion criteria, such as not allowing anyone to be on any other 5A reductase inhibitors or on any other drugs to treat androgenic alopecia like minoxidil. Hair growth progress was measured by photographs that were assessed by three experts after one, two, five, and ten years of treatment. The results were scored on a point scale, with negative three being the worst, meaning they lost ground, zero meaning no change, and plus three meaning a great improvement. This isn't specific in the sense that we're measuring hair count or anything, but generally, I think having a dermatologist make an assessment rather than the individual is a pretty good methodology for assessing results. So, after ten years, how did things turn out? So, after the 118 initial patients, only five dropped out due to adverse side effects, which isn't a bad thing. And looking at the remaining 113 patients, 86 of them maintained or had continued improvement even after 10 years of therapy, and only 14% worsened. Now, with regard to age in the initial Norwood scale, it is interesting that finasterides seem to even be more effective in older individuals with higher Norwood levels. Now, that doesn't mean that it is less effective in younger people, but it does indicate at the very least that finasteride is still effective over the long term in older men with significant hair loss. Now here's an example of a significant improvement with photos before treatment and after 10 years of finasteride. So keep in mind, this is with finasteride as a monotherapy. Many people who use finasteride also use minoxidil, which we know has a synergistic benefit. So if you're using finasteride and minoxidil, your chances of treatment losing efficacy is likely further reduced. So for the 14% whose hair did worsen, this does not mean finasteride stopped working. Rather, it means that it's likely their androgenic alopecia progressed to a level of severity where finasteride as a monotherapy was no longer effective enough. They are hair loss would probably have been worse had they not been in on any treatment at all. Much worse, probably. But of course, 
I must again stress that the overwhelming majority of people in this study, 86% either maintained or improved. So based on this data, the notion that finasteride stopped working doesn't hold up to any kind of scientific scrutiny. Now, regarding side effects, like I said, five dropped out due to side effects. However, there were two other patients who reported side effects, but they elected to stay in the study because they felt the benefits outweighed the negatives. So overall, the, investiga the investigators concluded that finasteride is both safe and effective in both the short term and the long term. No other standalone treatment for hair loss has been demonstrated to maintain this level of efficacy over such a long period of time, which is one of the reasons why finasteride is the gold standard for fighting hair loss and should be everybody's first choice. I mean, it's been the gold standard since 1992, in fact. So, to test the reliability of this study's outcome, let's take a look at a more recent study performed in South Korea and published in 2019. Now, unlike the last study, this one was conducted over five years, but it had slightly more patients, 126 to be specific. This study used a similar methodology to assess progress and the results as the last study. There were four clinical dermatologists who used photographic assessments of the scalp of the patients at the vertex and frontal regions, and they did evaluations of all patients at baseline line, three months, six months, one year, two years, three years, and finally one more evaluation on the fifth year. Now to judge the assessments, the dermatologist again used the seven point scale that was used in the last study uh, with negative three being the worst, zero being no change, and positive three being the best. They evaluated the results using what is called the BASP classification. So if this looks familiar, what it is is basically just a fancier version of the Norwood scale, and that is what is more often used in research due to it being more in depth, whereas the Norwood scale is simplified often for the sake of explaining hair loss progression to patients. So basically, the BASP scale is for researchers, the Norwood scale on the other hand is for patients, but both are certainly effective uh, means of measuring the progression of androgenic alopecia. So let's get to the fun part, the results. Well, out of the 126 patients, 108 or 85.7% showed improvement after five years of treatment. So I'm not even talking about maintenance, I'm talking about improvement. I mean, that's fantastic after five years. But breaking it down by scalp region, the vertex of the hair had improvement in 89.7% and the hairline improved in 44.4% and the frontal area behind the hairline improved in 61.2%. Now. This discrepancy is likely due to the fact that the hairline and frontal region uh, in most people are more sensitive to Di, or dihydrotestosterone DHT, which is why these are often the areas where people lose hair first. But the fact that improvement was still seen in nearly half of all patients after five years was pretty remarkable and further demonstrates finasteride's long-term efficacy as a hair loss treatment. And the only reason I stumbled when saying uh, dihydrotestosterone is because, you know, I used to say dehydrotestosterone, but then somebody pointed out to me it's actually not pronounced that way, so I'm still getting used to it, so forgive me. But anyways, let's talk about side effects. We know in the last Last study, only 7%, uh, 7 people, amounting to 6%, had side effects, and two of those seven felt the side effects were minor enough that they didn't want to stop treatment. But how about in this study? So, in this study, 12 patients experienced side effects, which is 9.5% of patients, and this may seem a bit high, especially compared to the FDA clinical trials, which showed about 2% of subjects got side effects, but according to the investigators, most of the side effects were mild and stopped on their own without any intervention whatsoever. Only three patients had to temporarily stop treatment for one to three months in order for the side effects to go away. So this is corroborated with the clinical research that shows that side effects uh, from finasteride will often go away on their own with continued treatment, and they always go away with discontinu discontinuation. And when people do get side effects, they are often mild and very easily tolerated. So in this study, finasteride seemed to be even more, affected, uh, more effective, even though it was conducted over a shorter period of time. Regardless, both studies clearly demonstrated both the long-term efficacy and long-term safety of finasteride, which should hopefully bolster the confidence of anyone who still has reservations about starting this treatment. But in case you are not convinced, let's take a look at the final and largest study conducted on finasteride's long-term usage. This study was also published in 2009, but in this time in Japan, and it involved 532 patients who were again given one milligram of finasteride per day over a course of 10 years. The efficacy 
efficacy was evaluated using a similar methodology to the first two studies, which again was photographs measuring different angles of the scalp, including the frontal and vertex regions. And they also used a seven point scale, but this time it was just measured as one to seven, with number one being significant hair loss and seven being significant hair growth and four being no change. So basically it's the same score system, which was assessed by dermatologists. And also there was a patient questionnaire to report side effects. Um, but as for the frequency of evaluation, it was done at baseline and then annually for the whole 10 years. So getting to the results, and keep in mind this study has far more subjects than uh, the other studies. If we look at the number of patients who had improvement, namely they had a score of at least five out of seven, the number of patients who experienced improvement was 91.5% over 10 years. That's pretty amazing, I think. Furthermore, if we add in the number of uh, patients who maintained or show improvement, which, which means they got a score of at least four out of seven, the percentage goes up all the way to 99.1%. Now, if that's not a convincing enough number for you to be convinced on finasteride's long-term efficacy, then you might as well just shave it, bro, and give up. But what about side effects? Now, out of all the 10-year studies, this one has the most subjects, so surely the side effect data here would be the most useful. So. Get this, you guys are gonna love this. There were no serious adverse side effects in any of the patients that required them to stop treatment. Now, there were some mild temporary reactions in about 6.8% of patients, which consisted of uh, decreased libido in 5.6% of patients and erectile dysfunction in 3%, but all these negative reactions went away during treatment. That's right, nobody had to drop out of the study because of adverse side effects and nobody had to stop treatment. This further demonstrates the point that people who get side effects should not assume they can't use finasteride. If you muscle through, you can easily um, see these side effects go away on their own over time. And even if you don't see them go away on their own, you can easily mitigate them through dosing adjustments, titration. Now, this might be a bit controversial, but nevertheless, I think some people might think the outcome data of the final two studies I'm talking about is somehow influenced by the fact that they have Asians and Asians never go bald, right? Well, first of all, the first study wasn't predominantly Asian and it still yielded similar results. And even though it's true, you don't see as many bald Asian men as you do Caucasian men, it absolutely can still happen. And we know that all the subjects in the Japanese and Korean study were subjects with androgenic alopecia. So yeah, it's rare, but let's not pretend hair loss doesn't happen in Asian men too. It absolutely does. I mean, the mechanism of androgenic alopecia in Asian men is the exact same as it is with every man. And if you happen to have the male pattern baldness gene, then DHT is isn't going to give a damn about what your ethnicity is. So I hope nobody thinks uh, to contest the data of these studies based on the ethnic group of the participants. I mean, that would be totally insane. But anyways, to summarize all three of these studies, they all yielded similar results, which prove the validity and safety of finasteride as an effective long-term treatment for androgenic alopecia. Now, personally speaking, I have used per, uh, finasteride uh, for roughly a decade. And even though I have used other things for the sake of just intellectual curiosity, I guess you could say, I can safely say finasteride has been responsible for most of my progress and it has been the bulwark in my fight against androgenic alopecia. It has lost none of its efficacy over the years and even when I just use finasteride minoxidil I lose no progress and I have had no side effects. So I can recommend finasteride not just because it is the most well researched and well documented treatment for hair loss but also because it has worked so well for me personally. Now I know people often like to think about theoretical treatments on the horizon, but you know, who cares about theory when you have outcomes? I mean, people can spend all day fixating over mechanism and theory on these hypothetical treatments, but in the end, if you can't test a theory and produce good outcome data, it really doesn't mean a damn thing. And I'd rather just use what we know works rather than making myself into a case study for something that may not work, especially when my hair is at risk. I mean, even Brizula, which is also known as Clascoterone, and is on track to become the first topical FDA approved treatment for hair loss is not something I would ever consider replacing finasteride with simply because the clinical trials have only demonstrated its short-term efficacy as a treatment for androgenic alopecia. Now, I know people are all excited thinking that the days of finasteride being the gold standard for fighting hair loss are over and that Brazula will be crowned the new king, but Brazula hasn't yet been proven to be as effective long-term as finasteride. I mean, maybe that will change with time, but for now, finasteride is what gives me the greatest peace in my, of mind in knowing that I am fighting my hair loss and that it will continue to remain as an effective weapon in the battle against hair loss for as long as I use it. And uh, with that, I think I'm going to go ahead and wrap things up. I mean, I hope I have quelled 
dispelled some of the concerns people have about finasteride's long-term efficacy. And regardless, I hope you've all learned something useful. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and work out. And then I'm going to go ahead and play one of the best games ever made. And that is, of course, Deadly Premonition 2 on the Nintendo Switch. I'll see you guys next time.